a good luck charm And you had to do, I could 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 do, that do, that but You are listening to Grammy's Rocket Chair on RLM Radio. The girl of your dreams has got to be in some bar. Sorry, boys and girls, but this is X-rated. So if you're under 18... Get out, goddammit! Get the point. Good. And now... Bend over. You all ready for this? We do it all night long. And now, your host, Grammy. Do, I could do, I could do, I could do, I could do. <laughs> oh, God, I love Roger Miller. And, yeah, I. Uh, the only reason that song even got f- brought up this evening is, number one, I was talking with my uncle earlier today while I was painting his fence. Yes, I'm still painting fence. <laughs> God. It hasn't been done in years, and so it's really drinking up the paint. But, uh, yeah, he said something about do wacka do, and I went, oh, Roger Miller. And then I started singing, you can't roller skate in a buffalo herd. But (laughs) it is a wacka doodle Wednesday, and that was just a perfect do wacka do, wacka do, wacka do, wacka do. So... (laughs) Y'all are listening to Grammy's Rocket Chair here on this Wackadoodle Wednesday on RealLibertyMedia.com Channel 10. Also on the RLM Spreaker Channel and lots of other RLM and Numenum channels like the RLM Radio.xyz site and everywhere. We're everywhere. We're everywhere. And it is a do wackadoo. And I just got I got to put this over here in the chat just because it's too freaking funny. Yeah, Axel Rose. He looks like some that mean teacher from Harry Potter. <laughs> you know the one that got Dumbledore kicked out. Yeah. Axel, honey. Not a good look for you, sweetheart. Oh well. So you need to be talking to somebody about that. <laughs> okay, I gotta retweet that one. That's just all there is to it. Cause that's just too freaking funny. <laughs> Okay, where's the other? There it is. Yeah. I had to. I just had to. Okay, so, and while I'm over here on Twitter, guess what? I have two, uh, 452 stalkers. I damn near went dyslexic on you. Not that that's a shocker, but hey. Um, yeah, it's amazing, I tell you. It's amazing. Yes, I have notifications, too. Yay, and Gary L is over here all over the place. Yay, Gary L, he's sharing all kinds of way cool stuff. Um, let's see, and Jabberwocky is also over here. Hey, JJs, how you doing? <laughs> oh, yeah, whispers in the dark. Sorry, hun. Yeah, I. Uh, mhm, I understand. I truly do, Riley, I do. Okay, um, so that's Twitter. Yeah, thank you, Barman, for tweeting it out. He's the awesomest. He's just like awesome sauce. And then some. You're the awesome sauce all over the top of like ice cream or something. I'm not much of an ice cream person, though, so. Mm, eh, okay, what's that? So what? Vote to confirm and move on. Oh, okay. Whatever. Whatever. I'm I'm checking out. I need to stop it. I need to move on. <laughs> I keep looking at things, and it's like I'm getting I'm getting all kind of sidetracked and squirrel. Okay, over here on mines, don't see a whole heck. Of, there's posting like crazy, but yeah. Ooh, I do like this one though. Greatest gift in the world is the ability to help others see past the illusion and recognize the divinity within. Also, just seeing past the illusion. Just that little bit right there, because there's an awful lot of illusions out there. We got some massive Kavanaugh illusions going on right now that, yeah, watch the bouncing nominee. How crazy is that? Oh, yeah. And, yeah, trying to declassify 
Russia investigation thing, and nobody wants it declassified. What the hell's wrong with them people? Hmm. Okay. Government grounds for gobbledygook. What? Okay, I might have to, might have to go to that one later. I need to stop looking at Twitter. <laughs> How about over here on this Freedoms Network? Hey there, all you effing people. We got I'm on and Grimner. Thank you ever so much, Grimmy, for uh, sharing it over here as well that I am live and in person. Um, Zena was over here. Zena Klovic and Oliver. Oliver, I haven't seen you in a while, sweetheart. Haven't even seen you over on Fakey Book. Are you not doing well? Sending you some healing energy, hun. I also see Cowboy Tech was over here as well as Majutur Souths was here. So I'm probably mispronouncing that, but eh. Thank you, Grim, for sharing that. I went ahead and put it over on Fakey Book. And speaking of Fakey Book, my brothers are having a pun war. And they're getting quite entertaining. Sick buggers that they are. I know it shocks you that someone in my family would have fun playing with words, but eh. Yeah. We got, other than that, there's not, oh, hey, cool, seagulls doing a dance. Tap dance, tap dance, okay, scrolling right along, moving right along. Over here on reallibertymedia.org, or realliberty.org, yeah. <laughs> it's a do-wack-a-do-wack-a-do-wack-a-do-wack-a-do kind of day. I'm just putting that out there right here, right now, right now. Uh... <laughs> ribeye oh yum that sounds good rob works where's the bubbler hun i do not see a bubbler tiny bubblers in my wine actually i'm not drinking wine you know what i'm drinking this evening maybe that's what my problem is i'm drinking cucumber water <laughs> this is first time i've ever really just kind of imbibed in cucumber water and it's quite tasty and it kept me hydrated throughout the day while I was out painting because it got up to 96 degrees out here today. And wind blowing 90 to nothing, so it made it like a convection oven. Yeah, I was having entirely too much fun. Fun, fun, fun. Okay, so over here on uh, realliberty.org, I see Grimner is here and Bobby Bain and Rob Works and Barman and Laid In Again and Gary L was here for a little little bit ago and so was Susan and Java, 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 Java. And Terry was here as well for a while. And looky there, all kind of other people have just kind of gone to sleep. I understand. You know, I just... I haven't been on the interwebs much the last few days, and so I kind of sort of had to do a crash course on what the hell. I need to know what's going on, because I haven't been paying attention to the radio or nothing. Nothing. Well, no, I take that back. I had a friend of mine message me the other day, and she wanted to know what the hell's going on on Thursday. Something about all over Facebook that there's going to be like this massive test of the emergency alert system and there's rumors that they're going to shut down the internet and all kinds of other fun crap. So I basically just shared that video that Grimmy put over in uh, RLO about um, seeing the two different things that eclipsed the sun and the shutting down of solar observatories and uh, said maybe the sun's going to shit on us and you know if it is or if it isn't there's no need to fret there's no need to stew because there's not a damn thing that you can do if the sun's going to go kablooey on us i guess we get to go into this next life quicker don't we so why worry about it why fret why run around unless you want to reenact that one scene in um what was it airplane but I don't think there's a gal around that we can all just kind of line up and smack the shit out of her. So, don't think we're going to go there. So, chill. It's okay. It's okay. Whatever happens, it's going to happen. And then you deal with it when it happens. Quit worrying about it until then. Jeez, oh, Pete. And that's pretty much what I told her, too. You know, there's not a darn thing you can do about it. So, why are you worrying? Why? Oh, God. Now I definitely need to close. Um... Twitter because there's Bono and Pope Francis. Ugh. Eh. Okay. 
So, now I need to get over to the place where you need to be if you want to give me static. Right over here on reallibertymedia.com. Join the chat. Think of a nickname and join up and give me some crap. Because if you try and talk to me over on Spreaker, can't do it. Sorry. Because, yeah, just ain't got the interwebs like most people do. Tin can, kite string, and duct tape. But it woiks. It woiks. Trump drops a hammer on the elf. Oh, no! There's no, not going to be another elf on the shelf? Ah, oh, there's going to be a lot of people sad. Thanks, Rob Works. Over here, I see Barman right up top. Hey, Barman, he is the most splendiferous bot in the whole wide world. Closely followed by Grimner, who's got to keep an eye on him, because sometimes Barman goes a little on the wax side don't you know the lovely moose girl is also logged in as well as the lovely kate yay did you guys get much of that torrential stuff in florida miss kate if you're listening just curious i know carolina's got hammered i have nephews and a great niece yeah i'm a great aunt which yeah i'm a great aunt duh that's a given but yeah it's like a grant or a niece had a baby and now that niece has a baby so i'm a double great aunt holy shit i feel old <laughs> oh well I, no actually i feel like me but moving along yeah i have people in in the carolinas that have all checked in they're all doing good everybody's fine minor damage on their homes so um da -da -da -da. Oh, <laughs> thank you, Vinny. Oh, oh, wow. I was kind of sort of a poet, too. <laughs> I didn't really notice that. Cool beans. I also see Phantom is over here in the chat, as well as Asmodeus Asmo. The lovely Beth Z is logged in. And there's Chloe. Colfax 101 and Cyborg Noodle, who will touch you with his noodly goodness. Bot though he be cyborg noodle is a he because he's got a noodle just saying i also see d d underscore c as well as dakota from before holy crap he's still got the multiplicity thing going on i'm here as well as gromit and i be don c and i be don c java 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 doctor 2 is also here as well as jj's hot jj's has things in scotland Bonnie Scotland. Uh, no, I'm not gonna even gonna f f bugger that up. I already did. Whatever. Juana Taco. Mm, no, having chicken. Having chicken from Popeyes. Leftover Popeyes chicken. Mm, mm, mm. Love that chicken from Popeyes. I don't go there very often because there's not one close by. But I had the opportunity over the weekend, and yeah, yeah. Kozu got a double dip of Kozu going on. Meister Brower is also here. Hey, Woody. Got a, a trifecta of poxes in the chit chat. Pox box and poxified and poxophone, as well as pop upon sauce and the lovely rain. Hi, rain. Also got RLM Fluke, the Vanna White of the RLM channel. And looky there, Rob Works, who fired up that bubbler and passed it around. Thank you ever so much, hon. Although I don't need. Don't know that I necessarily need assistance in that area today for some reason. I also see Sock Puppet. Hi, Sock. How you doing? Skittle, otherwise known as the f Bominator, or at least that's what I call him. I also see Trust No One is here, as well as Vinny, Vinny Slist. Vinny Slist? Vinny, what the hell are you? I don't know that I want the answer to that. Because sometimes you're a little on the wonky side. <laughs> Lovable wonky, but still wonky. And to round out the crew, Woodman. That's the alter ego of Meisterbrow, for those of you that don't know. Now, let's see. What kind of stuff is Rob, Rob is sharing? Oh, yeah, the kleptocrats that just can't help themselves. They can't help it. Can't help it. Um, Do what? HuffPo Hero. Da, da, Broward County. Flory. Duh. Oh, Florida State Attorney makes 108000 per year, steals cosmetics worth $43 in front of her own daughter and parents. Wow. 
Wow. <laughs> Damn. Talk, sweetie, you know, you ought to make enough money there, that $108,000. That, I'd be shitting and tall cotton out here if I was making that kind of money. Although in Florida, I think cost of living is just a skosh higher. Just a skosh. But, uh, yeah, still, stealing $43. Why do you need cosmetics anyway, hon? I don't want to see a picture because I may find out why. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm going to go to the motherboard. Because, you know, it's, it's like the mothership, only not. <laughs> it's motherboard.vice.com. Saw this over on Twitter. Decentralized microgridding can provide 90% of a neighborhood's energy needs, according to a study. This new approach could even pave the way for 100% self-sufficiency in power, heat, and water. Which I think if you do a combination of solar, wind, and geothermal, should pretty much be able to cover all the bases there. Now, excuse me. According to a new report funded by the Dutch government, it finds that microgrid technologies could make a local techno economy 90% self-sufficient through decentralized sharing of energy at the local level between multiple households. And you know, the, the picture that's with this is just pretty freaking cool. And it looks like all the houses have a major southern exposure, so which is going to get you lots of light throughout the day so you don't have to use so many turn on your light switches and shit. I rarely have light switches turned on. You know, if I have any kind of extra light going on, it's a lamp or something like that cuz eh, I just I don't like to turn them damn lights on cuz then somebody always forgets to turn the damn things off. Now, apparently a new approach could even pave the way for 100% self-sufficiency in power, heat, and water. And 50% self-sufficiency in food production. That's according to the report's author, energy systems engineer, Florin de Graaf. Yes. Oh, that's for the bored mothers. You know, my mother always used to tell me, don't say you're bored because there's always something to do. And we learned really quickly that if you... um told mom you were bored she would find something for you to do dan tenny c has joined us hi dan okay es lint is an open source project originally created by nicholas c zakas why thank you Vinny. hmm oh fixing to roll out and burn one. Ooh, burn what hun or do I need to ask? I'll bet I know. I bet I know. Okay, back to this article. So, if optimized properly, microgrids could play a pivotal role in supporting efforts to transition to renewable energy systems and meet climate targets. And if, um, this is according to the report that's published by Netherlands-based energy systems company Metabolic. Now, the report was funded by Dutch Ministry of Economic Affairs and the Netherlands Enterprise Agency. I had something from the Netherlands last week, too. Hmm. For such a little country, they sure are popping up on my radar a lot. Well, okay, twice in two weeks. That's a lot for me. In any case, under the Paris Agreement, the Dutch government has pledged to drop its carbon dioxide emissions by 80 to 95 percent by 2050. Great. Oh, sure. Drop your carbon dioxide emissions and kill all the trees. Thanks. Thanks, Dutchies. Yes. Ooh, Dan has five. Ooh, all righty. Oh. Well, see, Vinny, that makes two of us in, doesn't it? Thank you, Barman, for the Puff Puff Pass. Truly do appreciate it. Uh, do what? Alternate. Rich are planning a stealth coup. Ah, yeah. Well, it's not so stealthy for some of us, but yeah. 
Okay. Called fog. You know, if I had one puff, I wouldn't even have to do another one. Just one puff and I would be in a fog. Don't need to go there. Okay, back to this article. So, reaching the goal will require an extraordinary level of effort by any standard, but the use of microgrids, decentralized energy grids that intelligently balance the local supply and demand of distributed clean energy sources could avoid the need for massive spending on infrastructure upgrades, which, yeah, the infrastructure upgrades, I got to tell you, over here in USA, they haven't been doing them. I'd like to know where in the hell that money's going. Besides some lazy ass's pocket or a pencil pusher or whatever the hell. But according to the new report <clears throat> titled New Strategies for Smart Integrated Decentralized Energy Systems. Wow, that's a really long report title. By 2050, almost half of all EU households will produce renewable energy. Of these, more than a third will participate in a local energy community. So in this context, the microgrid opportunity could be a game changer. The report describes microgrids as the end result of the combination of several technological trends, namely rooftop solar panels, electric vehicles, heat pumps, and batteries for storage. Now the key is that these technologies are decentralized and they can easily be owned by consumers and cooperatives in local systems. So as time progresses, costs go down and climate awareness goes up. More and more people are starting, will start owning one or more of these technologies. Currently, DeGroff said that uh, the way in which we use these technologies is, in his words, dumb. We simply attach solar panels, heat pumps, and electric vehicles to the grid for our own separate purposes, which, yes, I agree, that is dumb. And, you know, even the wind turbines get attached to the existing grid. My kids had to do that when they had theirs down by Wichita. And uh, whenever everyone else lost electricity, they did too because they didn't want it going back down the line when they were working on the lines. Instead of having a cutoff switch to where you could continue having electricity at your house. I don't know why they didn't go that way, but they didn't. But it, they also saved a buttload of money. It paid for itself in a year. So... Um, apparently, this dramatically increases the load on local grid, requiring costly infrastructure upgrades to sustain the system. Yes, I agree. It does do that. People don't realize you have all your wonderful electric cars and the uh, generators that generate that electricity. Odds are they're using diesel and some other kind of fossil fuel, if you wish to call it a fossil fuel, although I'm not so sure it's fossil fuel. I think it's Mother Gaia's lifeblood and we need to quit sucking it out. Now, this is where the metabolic report calls, calls side systems come in. Standing for smart integrated decentralized energy, side systems provide a way to intelligently integrate different technologies to balance supply and demand locally in a way that prevents high costs. So, this integration should be done through an intelligent energy management system. Mm. And that will charge your car when the sun is shining and export excess electricity production to your neighbor's heat pump or a smart grid. Ultimately, this smart decentralized integration democratizes energy production and consumption. See, and that's what I don't like that democratizes because then the biggest user is the one that's the biggest freaking user. They're the biggest drain on. Not real crazy about that. How about you just make this stuff inexpensive enough to where everybody can have it at their own house? Oh, wait. No, can't do that. Can't have, don't have repeat customers that way. Damn it. It also allows consumers and cooperatives to take control of their own energy supply, which will help facilitate the renewable energy transition from bottom up. Which, okay, let's help facilitate it from the bottom up. 
Let's get more people allowed. You know, this crap of you can't go back to your property. I read an article about that a week or so ago. Can't go on your property because you're <clears throat> you're off grid. And we just can't have that. So we won't let you go back there. Thanks, assholeo. Hmm. Yes, the bottom up, it needs to start with individuals. We need to start doing our own thing. And yes, if you wish to do a cooperative kind of thing, that is fine. Where everybody gets to use a certain amount. And it, once you use up your certain amount, you get shut off. That way you don't have gluts on the system. People will learn to be more energy efficient that way. I know I'm being a mean old poopy head. Now, the Metabolics Report's findings are based on real-world data extracted from four cases in Amsterdam. One of the cases that stood out is, uh, oh God, circles, when you hear this, laugh your ass off, because I know you will. Ardehusen, Ardehusen? <laughs> It's a near self-sufficient eco-village consisting of 23 Earthship houses. By using mostly recycled, locally sourced, and low-impact construction materials, the Earthship design focuses on minimizing the ecological footprint on its inhabitants. Now, the system in place includes heat pumps, electric boilers, solar thermal, and photovoltaic voltaic panels, wood stoves, and grid connections. See, now the wood stoves, you're putting carbon back into the atmosphere, which basically lets the plants breathe. Although they're going, is that Uncle Tread that I just breathed in? Holy crap. Oh, well. The report found that Alderhusen's, Alderhusen's, <laughs> <coughs> excuse me, energy system overall significantly cheaper in the long run than the conventional grid-powered energy system, which, yeah. But that was without installing a side system. Now, the reports simulated or simulated what would happen if they implemented an intelligent, intelligent management microgrid with more sophisticated local supply and demand mechanisms. Now, these would enable the whole suite of interconnected technologies, a community battery storage system, smart meters, which actively monitor the entire system. Not crazy about smart meters. They put out more radiation than your cell phone does or your Wi-Fi in your house. Air to water heat pumps intelligently managed according to the actual demand, local energy trading between the houses so that they can exchange surplus, more electric vehicles, the use of combined heat and power, or CHIP, CHP units, which generate both heat and electricity using biomass, and the installation of a local district heating network to distribute heat to multiple houses. And it is kind of cool. It looks pretty cool. I need another sip. Real quick. My cucumber water. So, of all the cases studied, the Ardehusen showed the most promise, reaching an almost fully set or 89% self sufficient and techno -eco economically feasible energy system. Now, applying this model means that it is entirely possible to overcome the current incapacity of the grid infrastructure, which in the Netherlands can handle the input of only 25 to 30 percent of intermittent renewable energy. Using side systems, this percentage can be increased dram dramatically to as much as around 50 to 75 percent. So, such results are easily scalable and replicable to the rest of the world. There would be limits, though, 
depending on the national policy and regional factors like electricity prices, feed-in tariffs, wind speed, solar radiation, and legal regulations. Oh, here we go. Yeah, they're going to say, oh, you can't be off-grid. No, no, no. We have a regulation for that. And those could be a help or hindrance. Yeah, the legal regulations are most definitely a hindrance. A oh, hiccup. So, with the unstoppable emergence of electric vehicles, solar panels, heat hiccups, dang it, heat pumps and batteries, we will start seeing more and more of these microgrids emerge. The decentralization of our energy system is therefore an unstoppable force that will have a big impact on our renewable energy future. Still, this could well represent only the beginning of what is possible, with the end goal of Metabolic Team's technology research is a concept called Smart Hoods. Smart Hoods. Hmm. Now the project aims to design an urban system which integrates decentralized food, water, and energy flows in order to create a nearly fully self-sufficient neighborhood. It works based on the principle of circularity, recycling water, materials, and waste as much as possible within the system. Now our current simulations show it should be possible to become 100% power, heat, and water, and 50% food self-sufficient, said DeGroff. And living in a smart hood will instantly reduce one's ecological footprint by nearly 40%. So we envision it as the circular, resilient neighborhood of the future that solves many of the 21st century's greatest challenges. And the simulations demonstrate the potential viability of this model, but the next step, which DeGroff and his team are now working on, is to execute it on the ground in the Netherlands and from there to encourage neighborhoods around the world to take it up. Well, I think it's bleepin' brilliant. Brilliant! Other than the smart meter thing. Not real keen on the smart meter thing. And, well, you know, there's a few other things that I'm not real, not real keen on, but, hey! So, farce news. Farce news! What? Oh... I'm going to have to go there. Really, Rob Works? Holy crap! Okay, let me put this on realliberty.org and on that effing site. Dun dun dun. Do, I could do, I could do, I could do, I could do. <laughs> I wish I had your good luck charm and you had to do, I could 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 do. Yeah, I know. You guys are going to be really sick of that song by the time this show is over. <laughs> oh, I do like that song. Can't generate an image from the given string. Well, why not? Okay, RLO is having issues with that one. Now, thank you, Rob Works. Found something that was kind of, sort of cool, and yet mm, some of the, some of it's a little bit on the, on the. Yeah, you're gonna have to deal with this shit. But Rob Works just shared this over in the RLM chat. Um, yeah from en.farsenews.com U.S. removes freedom of the press from its legal guidebook. Well, you know, the press hasn't been free in, uh, like, forever. I think the CIA's owned it for a couple of decades. Minimum. Minimum. Well, since last century. That makes it sound like it was a really long time ago. <laughs> Which, yeah, when you stop and think about we're 18 years into this one and Man, that's a that's a whole wow. It's a whole generation, damn near. 
well, people in high school, senior year. In any case, this is from Tehran. The United States government, which earlier this year unveiled sanctions against top Iranians and national bodies, including the communications minister and the culture minister, hitting back for alleged media and internet censorship, is itself one of the biggest violators of freedom of the press in the world. Wow. Thank you for saying that, because, yeah, I've noticed that myself of late. Although they do have, you know, places like Google and YouTube and and Twitter and, you know, and iTunes. They have them do the dirty work for them. I roll, please. So, it's all for the distracting the attention of international civil society when the Trump administration imposes sanctions on Iranian entities and individuals for alleged human rights abuses and censorship, and then the U.S. engages in vast human rights abuses and injustice, and the evidence is plenty. Journalists and the free press advocates across the globe are responding with alarm to the newly released documents revealing the U.S. government's secret rules for using Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, or FISA, courts, court orders to spy on reporters and arrest them, calling the revelations important and terrifying. Now, the documents obtained and released by the Freedom of the Press Foundation and the Knights First Amendment Institute at Columbia University through an ongoing Freedom of Information Act lawsuit confirm long-held suspicions that U.S. government officials have been targeting known media entities or known members of the media with FISA orders for years. Now, these rules apply to media entities or journalists who are thought to be, thought to be, agents of a foreign government or, in some cases, are of interest under the broader standard that they possess foreign intelligence information. Okay, if you want to word it as foreign intelligence, it could be intelligence that is foreign to you, as in some kind of intelligence that... Um, utilizes common sense and critical thinking. That would be foreign to most governmental entities. Now this includes those running the WikiLeaks and the US government says that they are an intelligence operation too. Ah, so, you know, it, it is an intelligence operation. It's just how you word it, how you mean it, how you use it in a sentence. See, that's what a lot of people don't pay attention to. I totally sucked at English. You know, the whole grammatical thing and where you put the comma and the semicolon and all this other, and what's a noun and what's an adjective, and but on no proper placement. It's just one of those things that I couldn't explain it to you, but I knew how to do it. You know, except for the whole, yeah. But this whole crap of, you know, you need to stop and listen to a sentence and then understand or try and grasp all the different things that that could mean. Because, yeah, the U.S. government says that they are an intelligence operation. Yes, they are. It takes intelligence to run some of these operations, my dear. They are exhibiting intelligence. So, yes, they are intelligence operations because they are operating under the usage of intelligence. See how you guys like to play with words? I'll call your ass out on that shit. Now, additionally, even if not personally targeted by FISA orders, journalists, merely by being contacted by a FISA target or... Um, are subject to monitoring and abuse. Oh, you want to watch? <laughs> Sucks to be you. Now, the fact that these are kept secret under the Trump administration is cause for great concern. POTUS Trump Stilskin has repeatedly stated his hatred for the media anyhow. And as a consequence, press freedom is under threat from his administration, subjecting journalists to FISA court orders and more. Didn't I see something about 
on Twitter just a little bit ago about how they were, you know, people were in a tizzy fit because Trump wants to release all of the FISA court orders and all of that shit? Or did I read that wrong? I may have read that wrong. Trump will still skin is, is entertaining, if nothing else. But, yeah, don't be giving him all that credit. Because, yeah, there's people behind the scenes that are pulling a hell of a lot of strings. Now, <clears throat> indeed, no advocate of human rights, civil liberties, and due process would defend the current surveillance regime in Washington, which was in place decades before Trump Stilskin stepped into that building there. Not saying he's any better, but just saying he's not the only one here. He just happens to be the current bullseye target. Now, with its history of human rights abuses, police brutality and racism, wars and war crimes, clamping down on the press, persecuting black Americans, illegal immigrants, Muslim citizens and minorities, and of failing to offer legal protections and due process to those in detention. Yeah. Okay, I can't argue with any of that shit. Although, you know, illegal immigrants, it's, they're called illegal for a reason. Deal with what, if you don't like the whole illegal immigrant thing, deal with what makes them illegal. Now, the fact that the U.S. claims the moral high ground when it comes to human rights and civil liberties, which is quite laughable in my personal opinion, including press freedom, is one of the reasons why Trump Stilskin's own attacks on the media have been so horrifying. Actually, I find them quite amusing myself, but that's just me. If you really want to stop and look at the media, they need to be attacked. They need to be berated. They need to be called out on their bullshit. Because what they've been spewing for decades is bullshit. To go on with this, indeed, the moral argument for sanctions against other countries, including Iran, similar, similarly is not a tough one. So, for these illegal and unjustified measures to have any chance of achieving their aim, which is usually regime change, they inevitably result in widespread suffering of ordinary people. Yeah, that those ordinary people are called collateral damage, and they don't give a shit about that. And I'm not just talking Trump Stilskin, I'm talking the leeches that be that are in the background pulling the strings that he hasn't seen yet. He's just seen the Zapruder film, the real one. Now, at the same time, these illegal sanctions are about U.S. interests and foreign policy goals in the Middle East, rather than uh, they are about promoting press freedom and democracy in Iran. This hardly comes as, surpri as a surprise, but it fails on its own logic. Well, it always does. Anything that comes out of the government fails on its own logic. Because it has none, unless it's circular. Problem, reaction, solution. Ta-da! Now, the trump Stilskin administration has even removed language about freedom of the press from its own guidebook for U.S. attorneys. The U.S. Attorney's Manual is a guide to Justice Department policies written for U.S. attorneys and other department employees. It has been with significant changes... Yeah, to media relations section, changes that reflect a larger Trump Stilskin administration hostility towards members of the press. He has hostility towards members of the mainstream media, aka corporate lame ass propaganda system. And once again, I say it's entertaining for me to watch. I grab my popcorn. Now, gone from the handbook is a section specifically reminding attorneys of the public's right to know. Gone is a section on the need for a free press and public trial. In other words, the freedom of the press in the United States has declined dramatically. That's a given, been going on for decades. And the Trumples administration officials are not fit to preach others on the subject. Yes, I agree about that as well. They are dismissive of the important work done by the press, and they have shown an unprecedented level of hostility to the press and the international rule of law. Now, international rule of law depends on what you're talking there. 
uh, hit, yeah, it's an unlevel, unprecedented level of hostility towards the press because he's not the darling, and he's giving them a little bit of their own back, a little tit for tat. Once again, amusing, but it's also a distraction <clears throat> from what's going on behind the scenes. So for those who are probably worried about human rights and freedom in the world, you'd better preach your own government first. Well, hon, um, I would say not my government, but, you know, I happen to live in USA, and they happen to be the leeches what be. And until we get enough people to let them know that, uh, sorry, but we have found that leeching a person really isn't all that helpful and so we're cutting you off you know until we get enough people that are willing to do that we're kind of sort of stuck with this mess does not mean we agree with it does not mean with it we support it it means that we're kind of sort of between a rock and a hard place and it sucks, but it's getting worked on. I really honestly think there's, there's, there is some movement in that direction towards telling the government, we're sick of your shit. We don't need you no more. So... Okay. Let me see. Did he have that? How do you have your... I'll just do that. Okay. Do, I can do, I can do, I can do, I can do. Okay. Now, see, Gary, I'll just posted this. Okay. Let's get totally real. All of this amounts to is political theater and essentially business as usual, but under a rather more elaborate mantle. Fact is that much of what is being discussed amounts to treason or sedition or both. Um, under both the E or AUMF and the Patriot Acts, the actors behind all this could be construed to be aiding and abetting terrorism. As such, they could be seized, detained, and even waterboarded in Gitmo. All without any constitutional protections. So why isn't that happening? Why is this merely a collection of soundbite action items to transfix the public? Thinking people know the answer, and this, is, this was attached to Trump wishing to expose the deep state by declassifying. And it's a video, so I'm not going to not gonna share it. Sorry. But it's over there on realliberty.org. Gary, um, Gary L. just shared it. So I'm going to do that one. And did you know, you know, seeing as how we have that one. Let's go here to worldtruth.tv. Saw this earlier on Twitter as well. Over 700,000 people on U.S. watch list. And once you get on, there's no way off. Kind of like Hotel California. Only not quite so pleasant and doesn't have the cool Eagles music playing in the background. Now, the names of nearly three quarters of a million individuals have been secretly added to watch lists administered by the United States government. But federal officials are adamant about keeping information about these rosters under wraps. A report by the New York Times' Susan Stellan, published over the weekend, attempted to shine much-deserved light on the otherwise largely unexposed program of federal watch lists. But details about these directories, including the names of individuals on them and what they did to get there, remain as elusive as ever. More than 12 years after the terrorist attack of September 11, 2001, which was done by the largest terrorist organization in the world, the United States government, yes, I said that out loud, 
Federal agencies continue to keep lists on, on hand containing names of individuals of interest. People who often end up uncleared to enter or exit the U.S. due to an array of activity that could be considered suspicious or terrorist related to government officials. Now, we must understand the word terrorist is one who causes terror to be instilled in another. Also, it means one who uh, threatens harm for political or personal gain. Now, I'm thinking government officials pretty much fit in there, but those of us that know what the hell it is, I'm sure we strike the fear in their hearts if they have hearts. They're probably smaller than the Grinches, but I digress. So, in 2008, the American Civil Liberties Union claimed that an Inspector General of the Department of Justice report found at least 700,000 individual names on the database maintained by the Terrorist Screening Center, the Federal Bureau of Investigation sub-office tasked with overseeing the single database of identifying information about those known or reasonably suspected of being involved in terrorist activity. What a vague thing. Terrorist activity. Five years later, that number of suspicious persons is reportedly close to what it was at the time. Half a decade down the road, however, Americans and foreign nationals who end up on the government's radar are offered little chance to find out how they ended there or even file an appeal. Now, according to some, that's just the start of what's wrong with these lists. If you've done the paperwork correctly, then you can effectively enter someone into the watch list. Um, that's S-U-N-Y Buffalo Law School Associate Professor Anya Bernstein told Stellan this for the weekend report. What's more, though... According to Bernstein, is that there's no indication that agencies undertake any kind of regular retrospective review to assess how good they are at predicting the conduct they're targeting. Suggesting that anyone could be targeted and added to such a list with little oversight to protect them. Now, when you have a huge list of people who are likely to commit terrorist acts or deemed likely to commit terrorist acts, or they just happened to say something that gave you the willies, it's easy to think that terrorism is a really big problem and we should be devoting a lot of resources to fighting it. So with almost no transparency and out outrages aplenty, she argues that the government's watch lists are largely flawed and can erroneously ruin an innocent person's life. Well, you know, there's so many laws on the books right now that I think just getting up and getting out of bed and taking your first breath of the morning, you've already committed three crimes, according to the federal government. Now, such was the case was with Rahinan Ibrahim, a 48-year-old former Standard University doctoral student who was expected to be in federal court in San Francisco, California on Monday morning for the latest hearing in a case that stems from an incident in 2005 that ended with her learning she had been added to a terrorist watch list. Now, Ibrahim was attempting to board a Hawaii-bound plane from San Francisco International Airport <coughs> in traditional Muslim garb when she was taken into custody and told she had landed herself on a terrorist watch list. Nearly a decade later, Ibrahim continues to disavow any connection with terrorism, but the issue surrounding the watch list program has made it seemingly impossible to find out what she did, let alone have her name removed from the list. We have tried to get discovery into whether our client has been surveilled and have been shut down on that. Elizabeth Pipkin, who is a lawyer representing Miss Ibrahim, and she uh, 
<clears throat> added to the times, they won't answer that question for us. She doesn't want this to happen to other people, to be wrongfully included on these lists that haunt them for years and years. No one knows how the targets get on the list, she said, and the government has never contested this case on the merits. We don't think they have a defense. But with Monday's hearing, coming nearly a decade after Ibrahim first found herself in trouble, the likelihood of any reform coming soon to the watch list system seems slim to none. Now, the ACLU lawyer, Heine Shamsi, even told the Times that the system keeping the watch list intact seems to be more flawed than the one guarding over terrorist suspects held at America's military prison in Guantanamo Bay. <coughs> Excuse me. People who are accused of being bent enemy combatants at Guantanamo have the ability to challenge their detention, however imperfect that now is. So it makes no sense that people who have not actually been accused of any wrongdoing can't challenge. Now, a terrorist screening center official reached for comment by the Times claimed that fewer than 1% of those listed on such rosters are U.S. citizens or legal permanent residents. But Stellan points out there is no way to confirm that number. So, Big Brother is watching you and you might be on a list. I've been told I was on a shit list a long time ago, so it wouldn't surprise me none. I scream, you scream, we all scream for ice cream. Go on, Chloe. Although I'm not... Nah. Hmm. Kate befriended a duck. Yay, Miss Kate! Oh, isn't that just wonderful? You know, you can be on a list and not even know it. Oops. Doesn't surprise me any. There we go. Putting it over here on the RLM or RLO. Excuse me, I'll get this right. Bunch of sneaky bastards. Oops. Okay. And put it on the effing site as well. Because, you know, they ain't got nothing else to do. they got to justify their existence. So they're going to say that there's all kinds of big, bad, and nasty people out there. They have a list and everything. Yeah. I have a list. It's a grocery list. It's on my phone. Because if I write it on paper, I forget it on the table. It's kind of the way I roll. Okay. So. Um, oh, where do I want to go now? Yeah, here it is. See, I knew I had something about it. From truepundit.com. Eric Holder says, Declassifying FISA documents is an especially dangerous abuse of power. Well, how many times did you abuse power, good old Eric? Apparently, the former Attorney General Eric H. Holder Jr. said Tuesday that President Trump's decision to declassify FISA court documents and Justice Department messages about the Russia investigation is an especially dangerous abuse of power. Yeah! Because when that stuff comes out, everybody's going to go, neener, 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 we knew you were all lying. Mr. Holder criticized Trump Stilskin for holding his self-interest about the, the national security interests of the country. I think you mean above. Typo there. Eh. Well, Trumples announced the move Monday afternoon after repeated requests from Republicans in both chambers of Congress. Now, the House Intelligence Committee Chairman, Devin Nun is that Nunez, said it's laughable to claim POTUS Trump's order Monday to declassify documents related to the Russia investigation is a danger to national security. 
The mainstream media is buying the Kool-Aid. I'm thinking they're drinking the Fool aid and they're dispensing it to others as well. But that's Nunez said they're buying the Kool-Aid. And um, let's see. In a statement, Representative Adam Schiff called Trump's order a clear abuse of power and said he was previously informed by the FBI and Justice Department that they would consider the release of these materials the stepping past a red line that must not be crossed as they may compromise sources and methods. Oh, national security, that great big vague umbrella that everything falls under. What? Is he going to catch you with your hand in the cookie jar again? Now, Nunez brushed that off with what he described as a political play call, which has been echoed by the Democrats, politicos, and legal experts. It's laughable that they're saying this um, will somehow endanger national security. This is real full transparency for the American people, which I would like to see that. I would like to see them just so I can see what the hell is the dither about. Why do you not want people seeing this? Hmm. What you doing, Vinny? Yeah, Vinny, I'm sure you're on a couple of lists. You're on Vinny list. <laughs> Vinny's list. There you go. Okay. Dun dun dun. Okay. What? 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 Okay. I'm going to put this over here on RLO real quick as well. Oh, I'm thinking the big babies don't like it when someone calls their bullshit. Let's see, what don't you... Oops. And over here on the effing side as well. I'm just curious. What are you boys up to? Hmm. Hmm. Okay. We'll just do that one. Now. Now that I've done that one. Let's see, do I want to go here? Okay, I got to do this. This is from antimedia.com. I also saw this over on Twitter. Uh, school distri district to begin randomly drug testing high school students. Once again, your government at work. Yes, the school district is part of the government, for those of you that do not know this. Now, in Clark County, Indiana, a school district um, will soon be randomly drug testing students who want to participate in extracurricular activities like sports, band, and driving to school. Driving to school is an extracurricular activity. Well... Apparently, Henryville High School and Borden High School will randomly select 10 students each quarter and test them for 10 drugs that teenagers are most likely to use. If students test positive, they will be ineligible for one-third of scheduled extracurricular activities after the first offense. After the third offense, the student will become ineligible for the rest of their high school career. That even includes driving to school. You have no say in that. That is a parental decision. Now, while some parents support the new policy and hope it will discourage students from bringing drugs to school, others, like Lance Leach, feel it's too invasive. Yes, it is. I agree with you, Lance. Um, there has to be a reasoning, and you have to talk to a parent beforehand, he said. 
like suspicious behavior or they got caught doing something, then maybe, but not just random drug testing. Oh, and I would say that, you know, possibly it uh, violates constitutional guaranteed rights, but yeah, it's seen as how we all know there is no such critter. Now, the ACLU agrees the, the Civil Liberties Organization has long fought against drug testing in schools. In 1998, the organization attempted to challenge drug testing for after-school activities in Indiana schools, but the Supreme Court refused to hear their arguments. The following year, they challenged an Oklahoma school district, arguing in that case the after-school activities were directly linked with coursework throughout the normal day and that drug testing infringed on students' right to a public education as well as the Fourth Amendment protection against illegal search and seizure. Now in 2002, however, the Supreme Court ruled that it was constitutional for schools to drug test students participating in extracurricular activities because it was effective method of deterring drug abuse. Really? This assessment turned out to be untrue. Mm, that's kind of what I thought. The Washington Post examined one 2013 study that looked at 14 years of data on student drug use and found that school drug testing was associated with moderately lower marijuana use, but increased use of other more dangerous illicit drugs. Another study found drug testing was not associated with changes in substance use. Now, over the years, a number of other experts have expressed their op op opposition to the practice over legal concerns and the sheer fact that it doesn't work. The ACLU has cited the American Academy of Pediatrics, while other doctors have also expressed skepticism. Nevertheless, in 2015, nearly one in five public high schools had drug testing policies in place. Now, a nationally representative survey of 1,300 school districts found that among the districts with drug testing programs, 28% randomly tested all students, not just ones participating in after-school programs. And these schools are opening themselves up to a legal challenge. So, I think they're all open to a legal challenge. I think it's all bullshite. Bullshite. So, what is that? Hey, Woody. How you doing, hon? Yeah, I mean, a lot of people that I think would quit school if they did that shit. I agree with you, Woody. That's a bunch of bullshit. Um, do what? Oh, okay. Let me put this on RLO real fast. multiple levels and it is I, I think that's wow you are not going to get people to stop using drugs by saying we're going to randomly test you you know if you really don't want people to use drugs in the workplace okay fine I understand that you know because some some jobs are more hazardous than others and you really shouldn't be partaking of extracurricular activities while performing those jobs hurt yourself hurt other people that is like a, a between the employer and the employee kind of thing you know if you agree to go to work for someone that has that kind of drug policy then you have agreed to not partake but if it's not during working hours and it doesn't affect your job performance, who the hell's business is it? You know, if you want to do something stupid, you know, and if you overdose on something, well, if you survive, don't be surprised if you lose your job. Because there are some corporations that would not put up with that kind of shite. 
Just saying. So, now that I've done that one, where's the other one? Okay. So, since I've been covering all kinds of yada, 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 blah, 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 do, wacka, do, wacka, do, wacka, do, wacka, do, how about we come over here to personallibertymediagroup.llc or personalliberty, personalliberty.com. Um, government grounds for gobbledygook. Now, I have to admit, I saw this on Twitter and I saw the headline and that was all it took. <laughs> Because that pretty much states government. Government is gobbledygook. Okay, they have grounds for. But, despite a 2010 law that requires federal agencies to describe rules and regulations in plain language, most government writing is still unintelligible. I met with my Federal Bureau mole deep gibberish and his interpreter for answers now when potus or yeah when potus dangleberry signed the plain writing act of 2010 into law i said to deep gibberish all federal agencies are required to use clear government communication that the public can understand and use why do so few do so your query poses prospective considerations said the bureaucrat that rise beyond the level of considerations that the voter taxpayer base may be prepared to ascertain. Huh? I said to his interpreter. And he said that you wouldn't believe him if I told you. So, look. Content analysis company Visible Thread found in 2017 that most federal government websites were in defiance of the Plain Writing Act, still using language that is abstract and unclear. And though we comprehend and find favor with those considerations, Deep Gibberish said, we nonetheless understand that there are arguments in favor of providing the voter taxpayer base with the previous methods. Huh? I said, which, yeah, pretty much me, too. And he said bureaucrats have good reason for using government gobbledygook, said the interpreter, which, thank you, interpreter, because I really did not understand a damn thing he said, or that I read. So, let me get this straight, I said. A few of our legislators even take time to read the giant, or few of our legislators even take time to read the giant bills that they pass. Once the bills become law, bureaucrats create rules and regulations using language nobody can comprehend. How can this in any way be good? Well, according to a baseline assessment, Deep Gibberish replied, current employment rates would be adversely affected by changing resulting, changes resulting from actions directed by, but not intended to result in, jargon easily understood by citizens. To which I respond, huh? <laughs> but the interpreter steps in. He said millions of lawyers, accountants, and otherwise good living, good livings helping their clients. Or, okay. He said millions of lawyers, accountants, and others, ah, make good livings helping their clients comprehend confusing federal language. He also said that if average citizens really knew what government is doing, they'd be livid. So, you're going to have to explain, I told G Deep Gibberish. Well, he said, lawmakers and their aides are often persuaded at the behest of revenue-generating entities to apply lawyerly or terminology to obfuscate clarity in a manner that benefits their outcome. In other words, according to the interpreter, he said that bills were written in confusing language in part to conceal the special favors politicians slip in for their buddies. So that's why plain language is so important. The public, however, notwithstanding the active voter taxpayer base, may not acquiesce, said deep gibberish. And the interpreter said that he said, blah 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 
Yes. <laughs> That's right, Vinny. Thank you, sweetheart. Now look, I said, the regulatory review reports that the Administrative Conference of the United States, or ACUS, which is an independent federal agency tasked with improving federal agencies. Yeah, yeah, improving itself. Oh, we're independent. We're here to improve everyone else. You know, that's like a t-shirt I've got. I'm not always right, or I'm not a know-it-all, but if you just shut up, I'll show you how to do that the right way. Yeah, sure, okay. So, apparently they are tasked with improving federal agencies, and they recently approved a plain language in regulatory drafting recommendation. ACUS understands that plain language is essential to increase public participation in policy making. In other words, the public may or may not entertain its desired resolve, according to Deep Gibberish. Once again, the interpreter let us know that that was just blah, 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 blah. So, I said, the need for clear language is perfectly clear to me. In a well-functioning republic, citizens must know what their government is up to. Rules, regulations, requirements, forms, letters, etc. must be understandable. It's the law. Now what do you say to that? Are you nuts, pal? According to Deep Jiverish? Without government gobbledygook, how are my interpreter and I going to keep earning six-figure government salaries? Ding, 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 ding. Yeah. That's why they use gobbledygook, to obfuscate, or fib, in a pretty way. Ha! Huh. I hope now you know. Just like now I'd know that it's all blah, 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 yada, yada, yada. Okay. So, put this over on the effing side as well. So, I can go back for my podcast blog. Not real sure what I'm going to write yet. I'm sure something will hit me. <laughs> Maybe just blah da blah da blah da yada 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 gobbledygook. <laughs> that may very well be what it is. Uh, okay. Now, I think it's time for me to go check out my pocket because I know I stuck something in there earlier today that I swiped. I swiped. Um... Okay, why, and this I think Rob Works posted, I don't remember if he put it in RLO or the chat, it must have been realliberty.org. It's from informationclearinghouse.info by Jonathan Cook, and apparently he also has it on his site as well. Because when I saved it to my pocket, it also came up with the suggestion that it was on his site as well. So, why we're blind to the system destroying us. Part of it is, uh, we don't want to see, la 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 la. Now, on September 17th, 2018, Information Clearinghouse, I rarely use this blog to tell readers what they should believe, Rather, I try to indicate why it might be wise to distrust, at least without very good evidence, what those in power tell us we should believe. We have well-known sayings about power, knowledge is power, and power tends to corrupt, while absolute power tends to corrupt absolutely. Um, these 
aphorisms resonate because they say something true about how we experience the world. People who have power, even very limited power, that they hold on license from someone else tend to abuse it, sometimes subtly and unconsciously, and sometimes overtly and willfully. So if we are reasonably self-aware, we can sense the tendency in ourselves to exploit to our advantage whatever power we enjoy, whether it is in our dealings with a spouse, our children, a friend, an employee, or just by the general use of our status to get ahead. This isn't usually done maliciously or even consciously. By definition, the hardest thing to recognize are our own psychological, emotional, and mental blind spots. And the biggest, at least for those born with class, gender, or race privileges, is realizing that these two are forms of power. Nonetheless, these are all minor forms of power compared to the power wielded collectively by the structures that dominate our societies the financial sector, the corporations, the media, the political class, and the security services. But strangely, most of us are much readier to concede the corrupting influence of the relatively small power of individuals than we are the rottenness of vastly more powerful institutions and structures. We blame the school teacher or the politician for abusing his or her power, while showing a reluctance to do the same about either the education or political systems in which they have to operate. Similarly, we are happier identifying with excessive personal power of a Rupert Murdoch than we are with the immense power of the corporate empire behind him and on which his personal wealth and success depend. And beyond this, we struggle most of all to detect the structural and ideological framework underpinning or cohering all these discrete examples of power. So, it is relatively easily, easy, there you go Vinny, to understand that your line manager is abusing his power. But he has so little of it. His power is visible to you because it relates only to you and the small group of people around you. It's a little a bit, little harder, but not too difficult to identify the abusive policies of your firm. The low pay, cuts in overtime, attacks on union representation. I don't have a problem with attacks on union representation because I don't like unions. It's... It is more difficult to see the corrupt power of large institutions. Aside occasionally from the corruption of senior figures within those institutions, such as Robert Maxwell or Richard Nixon. But it all seems but impossible to appreciate the corrupt nature of the entire system. And the reason is right there in those aphorisms. Absolute power depends on absolute control over knowledge, which in turn necessitates absolute corruption. If that were not the case, we wouldn't be dealing with serious power, as should be obvious if we pause to think about it. Real power in our societies derives from that which is necessarily hard to see. Structures, ideologies, and narratives, not individuals. Any Murdoch or Trump can be felled, though being loyal acolytes of the power system, they rarely are. Should they threaten the necessary maintenance of power by these interconnected institutions and these structures? Now, the current neoliberal elite who effectively rule the planet have reached as close as absolute power as any elite in human history. And because they have near absolute power, they have near absolute control of the official narratives about our societies and our enemies, 
those who stand in their way, way of global domination. Now, it, one only needs to look at the narrative about the two men caught on CCTV cameras who have recently been accused by our political and media class of using a chemical agent to try and murder Sergei Skripal and his daughter Yulia back in March. I don't claim to know whether An Alexandra Petrov or Ruslan... Okay, yeah. Boshirov work for Russian security services or whether they are were dispatched by Vladimir Putin on a mission to Salisbury to kill S Scripples. What is clear, however, is that the British intelligence services have been feeding the British corporate media a self-serving drip-drip narrative from the outset and that the media have shown precisely no interest at any point in testing any part of this narrative or even questioning it. They have been entirely passive, which means their readers, us, have been entirely passive too. That there are questions about the narrative to be raised is obvious if you turn away from the compliant corporate media and seek out the views of an independent-minded, one-time insider such as Craig Murray. Now, a former, former British ambassador, Murray is asking questions that may prove to be pertinent or not. But at this stage, when all we have to rely on is what the intelligence services are selectively providing, these kinds of doubts should be driving the inquiries of any serious journalist covering the story. But as, it, as is so often the case, not only are these questions not being raised or investigated, but anyone like Murray who thinks critically, who assumes that the powerful will seek to promote their interest and avoid accountability, is instantly dismissed as a conspiracy theorist or in Putin's pocket. Yeah, it depends on the placement of the words. If you are a theory conspirist, is that as bad? No. Conspiracy theorist. Yeah. Although I much prefer conspiracy factualist myself. Now, that is no meaningful kind of critique. Many of the questions that have been raised, like why there are so many gaps in the CCTV record of the movements of both the, the skip rolls and the two assu assumed assassins, it could be answered if there was an interest in doing so. The evasion and the smear simply suggest that power intends to remain unaccountable, that it is keeping itself concealed, and that the narrative is more important than the truth. And that is reason enough to move from questioning the narrative to distrusting it. Journalists typically have a passive relationship to power in stark contrast to their image as tenacious watchdog. But more fundamental than control over narrative is the ideology that guides these narratives. Ideology ensures the power system is invisible not only to us, those who are abused and exploited by it, but also to those who benefit from it. It is precisely because power resides in structures and ideology rather than in indiv individuals that it is so hard to see. And the power structures themselves are made yet more difficult to identify because the narratives created about our societies are designed to conceal those structures and ideology where real power resides by focusing instead on individuals. That is why our newspapers and TV shows are full of stories about personalities, personalities, and celebrities, royalty and criminals and politicians. Yeah, criminals and politicians, those two go very well together. They are made visible so that we do not notice the ideological structures that we live inside that are supposed to remain invisible. 
News and entertainment are the ripples on the lake, not the lake itself. But the ripples could not exist without the lake that forms and shapes them. So if this sounds like hyperbole, let's take or let's stand back from our particular ideological system, whether it's neoliberalism, and consider earlier ideological systems in the hope that they offer some perspective. At the moment, we are like someone standing right up next to an IMAX screen, so close that we cannot see that there is a screen or even guess that there is a complete picture. All we see are moving colors and pixels. Maybe we can briefly infer a mouth or the wheel of a vehicle or a gun. But before neoliberalism, there were other systems of rule. There was, for example, feudalism that appropriated a communal resource, land, and exclusively for an aristocracy. It exploited the masses by forcing them to toil on the land for a pittance to generate the wealth that supported castles, a clergy, manor houses, art collections, and armies. For several centuries, the power of this tiny elite went largely unquestioned. But then a class of entrepreneurs emerged, challenging the landed er aristocracy with a new means of industrialized production. They built factories and took advantage of scales of economy that slightly widened the circle of privilege, creating a middle class. That elite and the middle class that enjoyed crumbs from their master's tables lived off the exploitation of children in workhouses and the labor of the new urban poor in slum housing. These eras were systematically corrupt enabling the elites of those times to extend and entrench their power. Each elite produced justifications to placate the masses who were being exploited, to brainwash them into believing the system existed as part of a natural order, or even for their benefit. The aristocracy relied on a divine right of kings, the capitalist class on the guiding hand of the free market and bogus claims of equality of opportunity. In another hundred years, if we still exist as a species, our system will look no less corrupt, probably more so than its predecessors. And I don't like to call any of them elite. I think we should call them exactly what they are the leeches. Now neoliberalism, late stage capitalism, plutocratic rule by corporations, whatever you wish to call it, has allowed a tiny group of leeches to stash away more wealth and accrue more power than any feudal monarch could ever have dreamt of. And because of the global reach of the leeches, its corp corruption is more endemic, more complete, more destructive than any ever known to mankind. A foreign policy leech can destroy the world several times, several times over with nuclear weapons. A globalized corporate leech is filling the oceans with the debris of our consumption chopping down the forest lungs of our planet for palm oil plantations so that they can satisfy our craving for biscuits and cake. And our media and intelligence services are jointly crafting a narrative of boogeyman and James Bond villains, both in Hollywood movies and in our news programs, to make us fearful and pliable. Now most of us, most of us abuse our own small power thoughtlessly, even self-righteously. 
We tell others that we gave the kids a good spanking because they were naughty, rather than because we established with them early on a power relationship that confusingly taught them that the use of force and coercion came with a parental stamp of approval. Those in greater power, from minions in the media to executives of corporate major corporations, are no different. They are as incapable of questioning the ideology and narrative, how inevitable and right our neoliberal system is, as the rest of us. But they play a vital part in maintaining and entrenching that system nonetheless. David Cromwell and David Edwards of Media Lens have provided two analogies in the context of the media that help explain how it is possible for individuals and groups excuse me, to assist and enforce systems of power without having any conscious intention to do so and without being aware that they are contributing to something harmful without, in short, being aware that they are conspiring in the system. Now the first, when a shoal of fish instantly change directions, it looks for all the world as though the movement was synchronized by some guiding hand. Journalists, all trained and selected for obedience by media, all seeking to maximize profits within state capitalist society, tend to respond to events in the same way. And the second, a pl place a square wooden framework on a flat surface and pour into it a stream of ball bearings, marbles, or other round objects. Some of the balls may bounce out, but many will form a layer within the wooden framework. Others will then find a place on top this first layer. In this way, the flow of the ball bearings steadily builds new layers that inevitably produce a pyramid style shape. This experiment is used to demonstrate how near perfect crystalline structures such as snowflakes arise in nature without conscious design. Now the system, whether feudalism, capitalism, neoliberalism, it emerges out of the real world circumstances of those seeking power most ruthlessly. In a time when the key resource was land, a class emerged justifying why it should have exclusive rights to control that land and the labor needed to make it productive. When industrial processes developed, a class emerged demanding that it had proprietary rights to those processes and to the labor needed to make them productive. So, our place in the pyramid is that in these situations we need to draw on something like Darwin's evolutionary survival of the fittest principle. Those few who are most hungry for power, those with least empathy, will rise to the top of the pyramid, finding themselves best placed to exploit the people below. They will rationalize this exploitation as a divine right or as evidence of their inherently superior skills, or as proof of the efficiency of the market. And below them, like the layers of ball bearings, will be those who can help them maintain and expand their power. Those who have the skills, education, and socialization to increase profits and sell brands. All of this should be obvious even non-controversial. It fits what we experience of our small power lives. Does bigger power operate differently? After all, if those at the top of the power pyramid were not hungry for power, even psychopathic in its pursuit, if they were caring and humane, worrying primarily about the well-being of their workforce and the planet, they would be social workers and environmental activists, not CEOs of media empires and arms manufacturers. And yet, base your political thinking on what should be truisms. Articulate a worldview that distrusts those with the most power 
because they are the most capable of and committed to misusing it. And you will be derided. You'll be called a conspiracy theorist, dismissed as deluded. You will be accused of wearing a tinfoil hat, of sour grapes, of being anti-American, a social warrior, paranoid, Israel hater, or anti-Semitic, pro-Putin, pro-Assad, or a Marxist, or narcissistic. I remember reading that last week, how those of us that tend to be conspiracy theorists, our tinfoil hatters, are narcissistic. So, there you go. There's another one that they can throw at us. Now, none of this should surprise us, surprise us either, because power, not just the people in the system, but the system itself, will use whatever tools it has to protect itself. It is a self-preservation thing, job security thing. It is easier to deride critics as unhinged, especially when you control the media, the politicians, and the education system, than it is to provide a counter-argument. In fact, it is vital to prevent any argument or real debate from taking place, because the moment we think about the arguments, weigh them, use our critical faculties, there's a real danger that the scales will fall from our eyes. And there is a real threat that we will move back from the screen and see the whole picture. We can see the complete picture of the scripple poisoning in Salisbury or the U.S. selection that led to Trumpelstiltskin being declared POTUS or the revolution in the Ukraine, or the causes and trajectory of fighting in Syria, and before it, Libya and Iraq, or the campaign to discredit Jerome Co uh, Corbyn as leader of the Labor Party, or the true implications of the banking crisis a decade ago. Just as feudal leeches, leeches were driven not by ethics, but by the pursuit of power and wealth through the control of land, just as early capitalists were driven not by ethics, but by the pursuit of power and wealth through the control of mechanization, so neoliberalism is driven not by ethics, but the, by the pursuit of power and wealth through the control of the planet. The only truth we can know is that the Western power leeches is determined to finish the task of making its power fully global, expanding it from near absolute to absolute. It cares nothing for you or your grandchildren. It is a cold calculating system, not a friend or neighbor. It lives for the instant gratification of wealth accumulation, not concern about the planet's fate tomorrow. And because of that, it is structurally bound to undermine or discredit anyone, any group, any state that stands in the way of achieving its absolute dominion. If that is not the thought we hold uppermost in our minds as we listen to a politician or read a newspaper or watch a film or TV show or absorb an ad or engage on social media, then we are sleepwalking into a future the most powerful, the most ruthless, the least caring have designed for us. Step back and take a look at the whole screen and decide whether this is really the future you wish for your grandchildren. Well, that sounds an awful lot like a lot of stuff that I've, uh, especially that last part, what I have been saying for a while now. There is a bigger picture and you need to step back and see it. Thank you, Rob Works, for the heads up on that. I'm going to go ahead and get this shared, and then I'm going to go check out the pig, because I need to find out what happened this date in history. Don't you know? Over on pigazette.com.
com. Okay. And now that I've got that there, and there, yeah, you either need to learn and question, or you will become a zombie. Or described as a zombie. However you want to look at that. So, PIGazette.com. Where did I put you? There you are. Okay, the word of the day is ambush. Yay! A Senate confirmation hearing where the nominee is sucker punched by a dubious 37-year-old Me Too accusation after all the questioning is ended. And what is it? She couldn't remember the year she just knew she was 15? Honey, honey, do you not do math? Seriously? Wow. Forcing others to not attend is nothing more than force. That, I agree with that. Yep. Okay. In the quotable quotes section, the state is the greatest fictio fictitious entity by which everyone seeks to live at the expense of everyone else. Friedrich Batiste, or Bastiste. And that's true as well. So many people do not understand it, though. Uh, what? Okay. Scrolling. This date in history, the 19th of September, 1849, Oakland, Mexifornia gets an early start on cleaning up its act when it becomes the site of the first commercial laundry. Measurable results are expected any day now. Ah, ancient Chinese secret. Yeah. This date in history, the 19th of September, 1888, world's first booty derby or beauty contest held at Spa in Belgium. And finally, this date in history, the 19th of September, 1893, New Zealand is first country to give female citizens voting rights. And that's why we can't have nice things. Yes, I said that out loud. Oh, whole voting process is messed up basically because the system is messed up and so you know when you're when you're partaking of a system that's already damaged from the get-go you're not going to be able to not by working within their rules you're not going to be able to fix it okay I got to check this out so Three ways leftists resemble savages. Hmm. Um, leftists and, dem and Democrats, self-described progressives, claim to be the cool kids, the rational ones, the enlightened ones, the morally superior, who know what's best, not just for you, but for all of humankind. That's the image they convey. But with about half of the population, it appears to have worked. But reality is another matter. Leftists do not epitomize 21st century enlightenment and forward thinking. Quite the opposite. In at least three key respects, they are more like savages. I'm thinking this is from drherd.com. Way number one. They're all about the village, not the individual. It takes a village to build a society. You didn't build that, as Dangleberry once said. The village did. That's how savages think and operate. Go to any third world country. They're run by villages. In villages, everyone is considered equal. In practice, they're equally incompetent. 
in a meritocracy, which is the opposite of a village, people are free to think, to be crazy, to be brilliant, to be whatever their minds tell them to be. And thanks to individual rights, individual property rights, which savages do not respect, others are free to accept or reject them. In most cases, the crazy brilliant types are rejected at first, even persecuted. But eventually, their valid knowledge becomes well-established truth. In villages, these persecuted geniuses never have a chance. You get to be the village idiot, is what you get to be labeled as. In way number two, they believe in mystical, illogical associations. Donald Trump causes hurricanes. Really? Is that what someone was saying? They really believe this. Trump will stillskin pulled out of the Paris climate change accords, and that makes him evil. No wonder we're having hurricanes. But didn't we have hurricanes before? Oh, well, yeah. But mystical and superstitious people who make loose, arbitrary associations don't care about that. All they know is, hurricane scary, hurricane bad, Donald Trump made hurricane, Donald Trump bad. That's all the logic and reasoning they need. If you doubt me, read the Washington Post. They do it in an articulate style. They write about, or they write out their loose association like a 21st century well-educated scholar. But, it is every bit as crazy as the remotely critical objective thinker. Way number three. They believe in force. You've probably seen the memes making fun of leftists. The memes say something like, if I like something, government must pay for it. If I dislike something, government must outlaw it. It's literally true. Leftists want force. They want people forced to pay for and even buy, as with Dangleberry Death Care, things that leftists consider valuable. And they want things that they don't like outlawed. Guns, for example, or speech that they consider hateful, which means any speech that they dislike. And the next step, any ideas they dislike. The Bill of Rights does not matter to leftism. All that matters is the use of force eradicating things they dislike by force and subsidizing through force things that they do like. In this key respect, leftist Democrats are very much like primitive savages. The village, erroneous logical associations, the indiscriminate use of force, these are all necessary components of leftism. These are what Democrats want. Now more than ever, they are the elements of savages. They are also the elements of totalitarianism. And they're getting more consistent about it with each passing day. So just do it! Well, thank you, Dr. Hurd, for that explanation. Hmm... <laughs> okay, I got to share the pig pick of the day because that, that's about, yeah, yeah, that's about what it is. Dental dams, what the hell are y'all talking about? Okay. Thank you, Hambo and Porkus over there on PIGazette.com. Calm. I truly do appreciate everything you guys put out there. Don't always agree with it, but I appreciate it. Um, hmm. <laughs> what else do I have? You know what? I haven't been to FARC in a long time. Let's go see what's going on over on Fark, 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 Fark. In their Florida section, the Fark headline is, Today, in conversations that could have happened, Florida woman, I want you to kill my husband. Hitman, what are you paying? 
Florida woman. I have a cute earring. Hitman. I don't care how well you hear. Okay, let's go check this out. I have just a couple of minutes anyway. Jacksonville mother offered Hitman earrings and cash to kill her husband. Hmm. Police say that Crystal Eli offered an undercover officer money and jewelry in exchange for killing her husband. She gave the hitman a detailed diagram of the interior of his place of business, the report said. And the suspect um, remains behind bars at the Duval County Jail after police say that they stopped her plan to kill her husband. Eli, a mother of three, is accused of trying to get rid of her husband in a murder-for-hire plot. The Jacksonville, Sh Jacksonville Sheriff's Office began investigating the 29-year-old after receiving a tip. A police report says that she met with the undercover officer several times in September and offered money, a pair of earrings, and two rings as payment. Well... Now, according to the report, Eli unknowingly met with the undercover um, officer four times and reiterated her desire to have the officer kill her husband in exchange for money. The report added that she provided the undercover officer with a picture of her husband, a diagram of the inside of the business, business she and her husband worked at, and instead of money, she initially mentioned that she'd give him a pair of earrings and two rings as payment. Now, each meeting was recorded in its entirety, and she was arrested at the fourth meeting on September the 13th after giving the officer the jewelry and a picture of her husband. Eli faces two capital felony crimes, con criminal conspiracy and criminal solicitation, and Lynn Harnage, who lived across the street from the family for seven y several years, said that she's blown away by the allegations. It's sad that she had to go to this extreme. I don't know what's happened since I've seen her. So, yay! Crazy people out there. Flory, duh, never fails to give you that just what you needed to close things out. Oh, fark off. <laughs> And if you wish to know, this is FARC. For those of you that have not been to FARC, FARC is fun. FARC, 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 FARC. I like FARC. So, y'all been listening to Grammy's Rocket Chair here on this do wack a 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 doodle Wednesday. I will be back on Friday for the Freaker Friday edition of the Rocket Chair. Um, Vinny, you are not doing the Ponder Gander on Friday, I'm going to assume. I have not looked at the schedule to see if what's changed, so I'm just going to ask you while I still have a minute or two. And, uh... Uh, Woody, pub um, money is being wasted on public education, period. That's what it needs to be. That, that's where you, yeah. Just end the sentence there. Money is being wasted on public education, period. <sighs> it's sad, but it's true. Oh, well, um, I guess, seen as how. That's all I have got for this evening. Thank you all for listening in and playing along. I really do appreciate y'all. Fark ye and fark them and fark off. Yeah. Fark, 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 fark. Farkers. <laughs> oh, well. I uh, will see you guys in the funny papers. Not real sure when I will be back online because I got a busy ass week this week. So I will be back Friday, though. So until then... Y'all stay safe, okay? And uh, if any kind of weirdness happens tomorrow, you know, like the sun explodes or whatever, guess I'll see you on the other side. But remember, I truly do love you all. And I wish you all enough. <laughs>